we're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. Welcome everybody to Redemption Church. We are a helpful church in Plano, Texas. I like that description of us. We're a, a helpful church. Next, somebody, next time somebody asks you what kind of church Redemption Church is, why don't you say it's a helpful church? Just see how they react to that. They're like, I've not heard of that denomination yet before. Let's see. Uh, my name is Chris Fluitt, and I welcome you in this room. If you're here, you wonderful people, welcome. And also welcome to all the people watching online uh, through the podcast and whatnot on YouTube and Vimeo and Daily Motion and all the websites there. We're in the fourth and the final week of our Help series, and here is a very quick review. Week one, we told you that the God who needs help from no one is calling, from your, calling for your help. God doesn't need nobody's help, but he is calling for your involvement. He is calling for you to respond and be a part of his plan. That's pretty epic. Week two, we told you that asking for help doesn't show weakness. It actually reveals strength. As a church, we openly called for your help. As a pastor, as your pastor, I openly ask for your help. And then last week, we drove into many of the ways... We dove right into many of the ways that the world is crying for help. The church of Jesus Christ should be a help to the world. Amen. That, is, that is true right there. Yeah. The church of Jesus Christ, it should be a help to the yeah. world. We must go. Jesus told us to go. We must be present. And we must be a help. At Redemption Church, that ought to be our heartbeat. I'm praying that that is our heartbeat heartbeat as a church. Today I want to talk to you about the most important election ever. Everybody in this church is like, what just happened? What is going on? I'm going to talk to you today about the most important election ever. Oh yes, we're going to dive into this highly controversial subject right here at church. Donald Trump Hillary Clinton are going to debate for the first time tomorrow night, Monday night. But before they take the Hofstra University stage in Hempstead, New York, I'm going to tell you how to make your vote really count. Really weird room all of a sudden talking about this. Y'all get ready. The election, this election in particular, is so important, Jeremy, that we cannot afford to get this wrong. I know that coming out and making such a political stand might make a lot of people angry with me, might people make people mad at Redemption Church, but I would tell you a choice must be made, and we're going to make a choice today. Are you ready? So who is it? Is it the Don? Is it the Hill? Who is it? No way. Neither of them. An election this important shouldn't be entrusted into their hands. I insist that you look at a third party candidate. No, Vicky, not Gary Johnson. No, not Jill Stein, Jessica. This third party candidate is not well known. They are being brought from obscurity into a place of prominence, this third party candidate. And this unlikely candidate, oh, I trust me, it is unlikely, this candidate. It, it's not a household name. Uh, they are what you would call political outsiders. But as a group of Christian believers, we should fully give this candidate our full support. Are you ready? Sight unsound, sight unseen, are you ready? Just, yes, four more years, let's do it. Who is it? Now, I know it is really brash what I'm about to do. But what I'm going to do, here it is. But I'm going to insist that this election, you do exactly what your pastor says. When you go into that booth, you do exactly what your pastor says right now. I insist that the candidate we throw our support behind is you. 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 Your election is the most important election ever. Yeah, all right. Your election. I'll explain. 
I'll explain it this way. You are God's candidate. 1 Peter 2, 9. Maybe you know this verse. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Raise your hand if you've heard that verse before. You've heard that verse before? It's a good verse, right? Man, I love that verse. I remember in Sunday school, we had a little song that went with it. it was, I'd go to town on that song. I want to tell you that you are God's chosen candidate. Now, right there, you might, if you're a normal person, it wouldn't be crazy for you to go, that's a bad idea. I know me. I should not be left in charge of something like this. I shouldn't be in charge of, you know, watching water boil. All right. Maybe, that, maybe that's how you feel. But I want to tell you, nonetheless, God chooses you. As crazy as it sounds, God chooses you, and he is electing you. The word for chosen in 1 Peter 2.9 is the Greek word eklektos. Everyone says eklektos. Eklektos. And that word means what? It means elect, elected, or elect, electing, election. It means elect. Are you following me? 1 Peter 2.9 says this, but you are a klektos. You are elected. That's what it says right there in the Bible. While all the world is looking at our country, you know all the world pays attention to the presidential election in America. Everybody pays attention. All the world's looking at our country and they're wondering who we're going to select as the next president. While that's happening, the Lord of Heaven is looking down at some people at Redemption Church. You got to believe that. If you don't believe that, you need to check yourself. The God of all eternity and of heaven is looking down at Redemption Church right now. God and all His angels are looking at you, podcast listener, right where, where, where you are. You don't think anyone knows where you are. God and all of his angels are looking right at you. The world is looking to a red or blue candidate yet again. Like that's going to work this time, we think. But God has elected you to help his world. That's what he's done. You didn't even know that you were running for office, did you? I didn't know I was running. What an honor, right? But here you are, and you've got God's vote. You are elected. You are eclectos. It means, that word means picked out. It means chosen by God. It means to obtain salvation through Christ the Messiah. Anybody obtain salvation through Christ the Messiah? Anybody? Then that means you're selected. That means you're chosen. That means he's all about you. He loves you. He is, you are elected. Look at somebody say, you are elected. The good news is you're elected. The bad news is you're elected. I'm out. I want you to get this. You are elected right now. I'm not saying you are elected when you kick your secret temptation struggle. And when I defeat that thing, then I'll be ready to work for God. No, right now. You're elected. I'm not saying that you are elected only after you graduate from seminary. That, no. I'm not saying that you are elected only after you preach a sermon or you hold a ministry title at a church. No. That's not what I'm saying at all. You are elected right now. You are chosen when? Right now. You are handpicked right now. You are selected by God and it's already happened. He's already done it. First Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen people. You are. Not you will be. You are a royal priesthood. It does not say you have. If you work hard enough, then you'll be a chosen people. It says you are. That's present tense. It does not say if you prove yourself worthy over time, if you give enough money, if you dress the right way, speak the right way, look the right way, listen to the right radio stations, then you are elected. Then you'll become a royal priest. No. You are a royal priesthood. On and on. You are 
a holy nation. You are a people belonging to God. You are one who should declare the praise of Him who has already called you out of darkness. The only thing past tense in this sentence is that He has called you out of darkness. Everything else is present tense. You are. You are. You are. The subject of election is what we're going to be talking about. Let me tell you, the subject of election can be controversial. So give me about five, seven minutes. Let me sort all this out. Take a moment to teach here. There are some who believe that God elects some people to hell and some people to heaven. If you look up, if you Google doctrine of election, it will bring you right to a thousand pages that said just what I just said. That, that's how some people view election, that God has selected, he's chosen some people for hell and some people for heaven. Are you following me so far? They believe that God has chosen or predestined, is a key word, people for hell or for heaven. And they believe that God made this decision when? Before they were born. Before they ever even lived, before they ever opened their eyes or breathed, before they ever walked on earth, before they ever had an opportunity to make a decision for themselves, God had already made his elected decision. All right, we at Redemption Church do not believe that is the biblical way to understand election or predestination. All right? If you got questions about it, glad to talk about it, all right? But let me explain it in a very simple way. How about this? God has a prepared destination. We're talking about predestination. Let's say it like this. Say this sentence. God has a prepared destination. He has a prepared destination for who? Everyone. Everyone. For all of his creation. He's the one that created it. He spoke it all into existence. Everything he created, he didn't just create it and go, well, I didn't plan on that actually going somewhere, doing something. No, he thinks everything out. He has a planned, prepared destination for everyone. And guess what? His destination for everyone is repentance. That's what the Bible says. 1 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Who does God want to come to repentance? Only the people going to heaven, right? Only the people that are coming to church, right? No, everyone. He's not willing that any should perish. He's not wanting anyone to perish. He has a destination for everyone. And one part of that destination is everybody repent. Everybody get away from your sin. Why get away from your sin? Because it is ruining your life. It is hurting your life. Just like a little kid touching a stove. You say, no, don't touch that. God wants you to repent of the hot stove of sin. Do you understand me so far? Do you believe that he has a destination for everyone on the world that they can repent? You believe that? Excellent. His destination for everyone, guess what, is salvation. That's his plan, to save everyone. His destination for everyone is a relationship with him. You believe that? His, little, his destination for everyone is actually heaven, where they would have an eternity with him. I believe his destination for you is blessing, purpose, power, strength, peace, love, joy. Do you believe that that is God's destination for you? Not only is that his destination, but he is prepared these destinations for us and for all, and he's done it all in advance. Are you with me so far? So he's created a destination for you, and he's created it in advance. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says this, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Say the next four words. To do good works, which God, say the next One, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. Prepared in advance for us to do. do. Notice that it says God has some destinations for you. 
He has some good works for you. And they are prepared in advance for you to do. Prepared in advance by God. Look at somebody again. Say, God has a prepared destination. It's a lot like Google Maps. It's a lot like your smartphone or your GPS system, right? You type in the destination. Somebody help me. You type in the destination, and then what happens? It gives you a road map. It, it shows you how to get to the destination. Big revelation, right? Huge, Pastor Chris. It's big. It gives you not only a way to get there, it gives you the best way to get there. In fact, there's options you could say, no, I don't want to drive on any ferries. That's actually in Google. Uh, you, I, I want to avoid tollways. I want to avoid highways. There, there, there are uh, apps out there that will help you avoid traffic. All right. So not only will it give you a way to the destination, but it will give you the best way, the quickest way, the fastest way, the safest way to that destination. But what happens when you go the wrong way? Someone help me. It tells you, redirecting, I've got this beautiful female robot voice that comes out of my phone and says, make a U-turn. Make a U-turn. It's like they separate U and turn because there's like a little dash there. Make a U-turn at a Rapio Street. It's like, it's a rapo, dumb computer. All right. Anybody else have that? It's like, make a U. And guess what? You drive right past Arapahoe, and it's like, make a U-turn at Camp Bell Street. And you're like, gosh. And you just keep going. And you could go, as long as you've got battery life in your phone, that lady is going to argue with you. And I'm not talking about my wife. I'm talking about this phone. Don't get confused. All right. Just because you have a prepared destination in mind doesn't mean that you can turn any direction and magically arrive at that destination. In order to arrive at the destination, guess what? I've got to follow directions. I've got to turn at the right place. I've actually got to go towards the destination. Man, I've, I've known some Christians in life that are so bummed that they don't have the successful life that they think that God has, they believe, rightly so, that God wants for them, but you just ask them, what are, what are you doing in life? And like, well, you know, I'm doing this. Like, well, God wants you to have all this, but you have to walk this way. You want a healthy marriage? Don't do some of those things you're doing. Forgive them. You're, that's how you get to that destination. You follow me. It, don't blame God about the destination if you aren't willing to follow the direction. Where's the direction at, everybody? It's Jesus. It's your Bible. It's the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you. Just because you have a prepared destination in your mind doesn't mean you can turn any direction and magically be there. That is how it is with God. I want to tell you that God has prepared coordinates for you. He knows the spiritual latitude and longitude of your life. Not just in spiritual matters, but in physical matters too. He cares about the physical. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to be healthy. All those things are physical. God is all about you, both natural and supernatural. He's got the concordance already prepared but you have to do your part. God has called you. He has elected you, but you must do your part. Are we understanding prepared destination? Are we understanding that? Are we understanding election? You see, you play a part. Are you doing your part? If God has elected you, if he has selected you, if he has called you and said, I've got something for you to do, then that means he's got a part for you. Are you playing your role in this, in this part? You are elected. You are chosen. But do you know your part? There's a lot of people that don't understand 
what God wants them to do. If you don't understand what God wants you to do, you do need to open your Bible. If you don't understand what God wants you to do, you do need to pray. That is the number one thing that you need to figure out in life. What is God wanting you to do? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, it says this. We are laborers together. That is something God wants us to do. You believe that? We are laborers together workers together. Guess what? You have co-workers. If you're not sure what your part is to play, you ought to look around because you ought to be finding somebody to work with. You shouldn't be a lone ranger doing everything by yourself. You should be looking around because God has fellow laborers all around you and you're supposed to be laborers together. Guess what? We should be helping each other. Part of his election for you is for you to look around in the body of Christ to connect and help others and to receive help from them. We should support each other. You should be receiving support from other people. The church of Jesus Christ should be a place where no one walks alone. You believe that? If we're laborers together, then you aren't working alone. You aren't walking alone. You don't go through hardships alone because there's somebody who says, I'm called to stand beside them. The Bible says that you are called to stand in the gap for your brother or your sister. That you are suppo- the, the place where there is lack in their life, imagine this big gap. You're supposed to co- stand in the middle of that and fill that gap up with your labor, with your work for them. The church of Jesus Christ, it it should be a place where where people aren't alone. Sadly, people come to church all the time and feel alone. Let me tell you, it stinks. And that's not a good representation of the church. I want to tell you that you're surrounded by brothers and sisters. You are surrounded by fellow laborers. So if you feel like you're doing everything alone in life, that's on you. That's on you. Ask for help. Be in relationship with people. Talk to people. Have the guts to say, I have a problem. Can we talk about it? Have the guts to do that. Have the faith to do that. You're surrounded by people that are working. And they'll work together with you. The Lord has chosen us. He's elected us to be this kind of help for each other. The call of pastor isn't like this crazy different different spiritual plane of existence than, than what you're going through. We're both called to help each other. I need your help. If you ever need help, I want you to call me. We had that lady Pastor Marshall was talking about that was calling for help. I'm so glad she called us. I am so glad she called us. We're fellow laborers. What's her spiritual condition? I don't know what her spiritual condition is, but I know the calling of God. I know that I'm elected. I know that I'm chosen to help people. I know that God has blessed me in order to be a blessing. I know it. So what am I doing? The Lord's chosen us. You You can fulfill most of your callings in life. You don't know what your callings are in life? That's all right. You don't have to, like, know each one of them. All you have to do to fulfill most of your callings in life is simply be a help. Simply be a loving source of support for your brothers or sisters. I guarantee you, you will nail most of the things that God has called you to do if you will just do that. You can fulfill most of your callings just that way. Now, I love 1 Corinthians 3 9. This is one of my favorite verses. If, it, if that verse stopped right there, it's already a great verse because it means you're not alone. It means that you're locked into a body. It means that, that you have people working with you. It, th- there's all kinds of good things there, but that verse doesn't end there. The best part of the verse is coming up. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, we are laborers together with God. You see, I think I can get you to understand we look around and we see each other as co-workers working together. But God, in this scripture, 
Paul wants you to know this about God, that you ought to view God as a co-worker. You ought to view God as a fellow worker with you, a fellow laborer. That we are all working together, but we are all actually working with God. Did you know that God wants you to work with him? Have you ever gotten the phone call that says, you got the job? All right. It is impossible to get that phone call and not smile. Am I correct? It's impossible. Just slam that phone, go, I got the job. Never happens, though. You're like, I got the job. Like, like people go crazy, right? Quiet people get loud. Quiet people try to nonchalantly go, oh, you know, it was just the, it was just the company and I got the job. Vandalay Industries. It's good. Seinfeld reference, internet. All right. We are laborers together with God. It's so cool to work with your church. It doesn't compare to working with God. You can work with some amazing human organizations. You can work with some organizations that will help save the rainforest. Beautiful thing to do. You can, you can work in some organizations that will stop world hunger. Absolutely do it. Go do it. But there is nothing like working with God. And that he has invited you to work with him. It, just the word is so different there. Not for God. You see, that's usually how we think about it, right? We're laborers together for God. Oh, but it's so different when you say with God. Have you ever worked with God? Give me a nod if that's you. Have you ever felt like, you, oh, man, I did something and I did it with God? Oh, man, that feels so good because I know all the times in my life where I was like going the opposite direction of God. I did some things anti-God. Sin, unforgiveness, but man, to do things with God. That is what election is. He's not said, these people are all doomed to hell, these people are all doomed to heaven. Doomed to heaven. Invited to heaven. He is saying, I want everyone to work with me. I want everyone to be my fellow Laborer, but at the end of the day, it's your call. At the end of the day, it is up to you to go the right direction. At the end of the day, it is up to you to cooperate. At the end of the day, it's your call. It's your call in multiple ways because it's your call. That means it's like your purpose in life. It means that is, that is your authority to go do that thing because the God that you're working with, he's also going to give you the power. He's going to give you the anointing. He's going to open up doors for you. He's going to do all those awesome things for you. That's your call that you ought to fulfill. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. The word there is eclectos. Few are Elected, You see, you play a part in this because not only is it your call to fulfill, but it is your call inside your own heart, inside your own free will to say, yes, I will, God. The God of the universe is calling and electing people. And some people say no. And that's crazy. That's crazy. The biggest regrets I have in life are the moments where I told him, I told him no. I would tell you that God is not electing you. He already has. That you don't have to come to the altar today and say, God, please have some humble work for me to do in your kingdom. No, he's already got something for you to do in his kingdom. It's prepared in advance. He's been waiting for you to get here. Oh, you're finally here. I've got this thing for you to do. You see, that's how it is in the church. Everybody that gets saved, he's got something for them to do immediately. You see, that is why. That when you got saved, you were so excited. If you weren't excited when you got saved, we ought to talk a little bit. Because when you got saved, there's something inside of you that said, I got to go tell somebody about this. You even thought of the person. I 
remember eight-year-old me going, my friends, I cried and bawled at the church. I calmed down. I went to the car. We were driving to Mazio's Pizza. I started bawling and crying again. I went to Mazio's. No one cries while they eat pizza. So I didn't cry at Mazio's. But then I got in that car. I drove rode back with my dad, and I started crying again. Why? Because I knew some friends, I knew some things that God was calling me to do. I could name people that it was my job, I knew it, to go tell them about Jesus Christ. No one had to tell me that. I didn't have to go to a four-week Bible study where they said, now this is what you're supposed to do. It's called the Great Commission. Didn't know what the Great Commission was. Didn't know how to lead someone down the Romans road or whatever you want to call it. But I knew that God had this for me to do. Redemption Church, do we still feel that way like we were first saved? Oh, we ought to. We ought to be that kind of church that is just as passionate. I tell you what, when I was a young Christian, I did some dumb things. <laughs> I I had some zeal, but I also had low intelligence when it came to using Scripture. Low intelligence on how to do it. I, I stepped in it once or twice there, actually. But guess what? I would take that over not being passionate, not caring. Go ahead and make mistakes for Jesus. Go just do something. Go try to do it. You see, Chris Fluitt now wants to kind of sit back and go, no, let's just be wise about everything. No, there comes a time, Dwight, where you just got to be passionate about it, where you got to get that heartbeat that's on fire for Jesus and get it activated and just, the Bible says, in that moment, don't even think about what you're going to say because in that same moment, the Holy Spirit is going to give you the words, okay, good enough for me, Lord. Bam. you do that? I'm elected. How can you do that? The Holy Spirit, the power of God is inside of me. How can you do that? I've got a job to do. How can you do that? How can you not do that? It's your call today. What are you going to do about it? These altars are open right now. Why don't you come? Why don't you pray about it? Why don't you spend some time talking to God? Why don't you get a hold of that Maybe eight-year-old you that just found Jesus. Why don't we get back to that kind of passion? Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you don't feel saved today. Let's pray about it. Let's talk about it. You can be saved right here today, and you can walk right into the plan and the purpose that God has from you for you, and it's prepared in advance. It's waiting for you to arrive at this moment. You come and pray. I'm going to pray over you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you to be right here in this room. Lord, we ask you to open up our eyes to spiritual things, God. Lord, we ask you to encourage people. Lord, we ask you, Lord, to reveal to them what their calling is. Lord, Lord, reveal to them that they are important in your kingdom. Reveal to them how they are to be laborers together. And reveal to them how they're supposed to be working with you, God. Lord, we pray all of this. Lord, let us be a help to a lost and dying world. Let us be a help, God, to our friends and family. Lord, let us be a help to Plano, Texas. Let us be a help to North Dallas, God. Lord, let us be a help to our families. Let us be a help to the world. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. If you want special prayer, you just come in the first two feet. We're going to pray with you today. Come on, let's take a few moments. For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com. We want to hear from you, so be sure to connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or even our anonymous question text line at 214-856-0550. Thank you for joining us and have a blessed day.